afternoon, everybody. We should be back from lunch. Let's do roll call to establish. Let's do roll call to establish a quorum. Dolores Trujillo is present. Elizabeth Woods. Jovita Dominguez. Jovita present. Susan Naranjo. And Imelda. Melda? I think I saw her um, like a little caution sign right after she spoke. Hmm. She might have, oh, but she's on our thing. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed a caution sign, like, you know, like a. She a, just dropped off her participants list. I'm sure she's restarting. She did have a, um, a caution sign on her. Uh, I'm told that Imelda lost connection. So let's give her a second to get back. All right. Mark, as we're working to get Imelda back on, we can take information item only um, because we will not require any vote on them. So, um, if if we don't mind, I'll go into and just kind of give a quick um, on 9.4 NCLEX updates. This is part of the change that we were discussing yesterday where we're trying to expedite and do a lot of the work um, within the committee meetings and um, allow for a more robust discussion during the board meetings. So the NCLEX update is a report. It is included in the materials package and um, that is there for anybody to read. We will not be verbally going over this unless any of our board members have a question on that. Um, so with 9.4, I open it up to discussion amongst the board members. And if there is no discussion, um, we can open it up to public comment.
Okay, if there's no discussion and you want to open it up to public comment, um, board moderator, please open up to public comment for 9.4. Mark, I am not able to hear you. Sorry, we will be opening for public comment now. I will be open. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for a comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Board President Chahilio, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. And since 9.4 was information only, we'll go on to 9.5. 9.5 is um, similar to what just happened with 9.4. That is the licensing unit update. Again, that report is in your materials. Um, if the public or the board has any questions, feel free to um, discuss at this point and ask any questions. If not, we can open it up to public comment. Looks like there is no public, um, no board discussion. Um, board moderator, can you open up to public comment, please? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. <clears throat> I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Kathy Hughes would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Kathy. This is this is Kathy Hughes. I'm a registered nurse and the director of the Nurse Alliance of SEIU California. I had a quick question that I think is now the right time to ask it and you may not be able to answer it, but there was an executive order that was waiving some of the licensing requirements for travelers that I think is due to expire on December 31st. And our union was wondering if we expect, I know that it came from the governor's office, but if there is any um, insight into if that um, is gonna be extended at the end of the year, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I can answer that. Actually, this is the perfect time. It's a licensing update and this is about licensing. Um, the, I believe the item that you're talking about is the waiver that allows for the use of EMSA where the out of state RNs can come in through EMSA and they do not have to be licensed through BRN. That was scheduled to expire December 31st, 2021. That has been extended to the end of March. I believe it is now till March 31st, 2022. That is um, in alignment with the emergency order and EMSA staff that are out of state practitioners um, can continue to be utilized in our healthcare facilities through that organization until that period.
board moderator, are there any more public comments? Board President Trahelia, there are no other requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, again, being that was information only, there is no um, vote that is needing to be done. We're still working to get Imelda back so that we have a quorum. The next item, um, Board President Dolores, I would like to request that we skip to the ledge committee yeah. um, instead of going to enforcement because enforcement is Imelda's committee. So if we can yeah. go to the ledge committee, we can elevate um, Gapreet Kaur um, and she is available for any questions. Um, again, typically, um, and I will check to see if Gapreet has any updates, but I just, again, for a matter of um, time and expediting today, 11.1, the report on the legislative committee and the legislative updates was giving during the leg legislation committee. And unless there are any changes, this again would be information only. Um, so the, the ask is, is that if there are no changes to the update that we received on the committee, is that um, we open it up to discussion and um, with the board and then go to public comment. Imelda, are you able to unmute? Are you able to speak? If you're on your phone, Imelda, it's uh, star six or pound six. Typically on phones, board moderator, we have to unmute the phone and then additionally do the star six. So it is a two step to unmute. I'm not sure if that's helpful at all. She unmuted herself. Can you elevate Capreet um, to a panelist, please? And we can go on with agenda item 11.0 as we continue to work with um, Imelda. Good yeah, I don't think there's um, are, anything at 11 that we will have to take a vote of any type. I just just want to make sure. So Gapreet, is there um, any updates to the report that you gave out at the legislative committee? Uh, good afternoon, board members. No, there are no updates necessarily. There uh, is just a uh, you know, just no review uh, basically that was provided to the committee, but if that is something that the board would like as well, just an overview, um, I can provide that. Otherwise, there, there really are no uh, updates since, since the session ended on September 10th. Thank you, Gapri. In the interest of time, we'll open up to the board now without uh, an additional report and see if there are any questions that the board may have. And if there's no questions, we'll go out to public comment. Board president, right. looks like there's no discussion. Do you want to go out to public comment? Uh, yes, BRN moderator, please open it for public comment. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for a comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Board President Trahilia, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, thank you. 
board president, the next agenda item is 10.0 report of the enforcement intervention committee. Um, I would like to see if Imelda is able to participate, but again, if she is not, this is information only. Um, and we can um, continue with this if needed. Sure. Did we lose Imelda? I don't see her. She's Imelda is showing in my panelist list. I just need to go for it. There she is. She's muted. You're muted, Imelda. Board staff is working with um, Imelda at this point. So we'll give just, just a few minutes to see if we can get her up and um, able to participate. Looks like she's unmuted. Melda, can you hear us? We just can't hear you. In some of our advisory committees, when we do run into issues, um, another committee member can call them on their phone and put them on speaker. Um, does one of the board members have a Melda's phone number that they can call her in on and put her on speaker? Betty, did you want to try to call her in and see if you can get her on speaker so that she can participate in this agenda item? Second. And Betty, I'm having a very difficult time hearing you. I'm not sure if you're away from your mic or. Yeah, so did I. I had a closer. Do you, is that any better? That is yeah, much better. better. Please, oh, thank you. Sitting too far back, I suppose. All right, let me get. We can hear the voicemail, Betty. Um, I just got a message from board staff that they believe they have this fixed and they are continuing to work with Imelda. Okay. So they've asked for just a couple minutes of our time. The board members want to take a moment to prepare for the next agenda item, which will be 9.6. Um, this may be a very good moment to go into the materials and um, just refresh on what the um, agenda item is for 9.6 and that there are two topics of discussion within one. It does affect one regular run regulation 1426. And um, there are also some items, another supplemental material on agenda item 9.6 that does say California current clinical hour requirement 
And that might be something of interest for you guys to just kind of review during this time where we're waiting to get Imelda up and running. We're able to see Imelda and we do see your phone. Imelda, are you able to speak? We are not able to hear you. No, we can see you, but we cannot hear you. Tell her I'll call her. She can answer her phone if we can get her. Imelda, is your camera coming from your phone or your computer? Betty says she is going to try to call you on your phone and then that way you can have audio. If you want to leave your computer up for visual, um, we can tag team this and make yeah. it work. I have her on so the phone. I called the number and we can hear you, Imelda. But I mean, you that I can't, they have to do it. So I have you on my phone on speaker so that you should be able to hear what's going on and people can hear you. I can. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you, Imelda. Yes, through the speaker on your phone that Betty is using through her speakers. Yeah. Okay, Imelda, we have moved on to item 10.0, report on the Enforcement Intervention Committee. Um, it is information only, and it is in our materials package. And we're not planning on reviewing it or reading it out loud unless there are specific questions or conversation that you may have around it. So we want to open it up to see if you have any questions around the enforcement updates that is information only. Susie, now this I have back with the moving up to item uh, 10 0. Not sure who, if it's Shannon or someone else providing the uh, information update for item 10.1. Imelda, are you able to hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. This is a change on the way that this is done. This was an enforcement update that was given in the enforcement committee, and um, it is here for information only. We are wondering if you have any questions or updates, and if there's no questions or updates, we will open up to public comment. Melda, are you still there? I'm here. I can hear you guys. So, oh, Mark okay. needs to open it up to public comment. Sounds great. Board moderator, can you open up to public comment, please? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. 
please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a, remind, a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Seha Buckwitz, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Thank you everybody for bearing with us through these technical difficulties right now. Um, this is not something that we would typically um, have to manage through. It looks like Imelda has dropped off the panelist list. Still on my phone. Um, is she is still on your phone, Betty. I'm trying to go get figure it out. We are not able to hear her at all. Imelda. No, if she's here. There is a call in number that our board staff has provided her with. She's back. Melvis back on the phone here. So we can go ahead and move on to item 10.1.1 update on the DOI DRS pilot project. This is uh, informational only. Do we need to hear a report from staff or can we go ahead and open it for public comment? We can open for public comment if there's no discussion within the board members. Are there any discussion from board members? Do you have any questions regarding the report that was submitted. The update. Okay, seeing none. While well, hearing that, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, moderator, would you please open it for public comment? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Seha Bekowitz, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. Imelda, if you can continue to work with board staff, I would like to get you up and fully functional um, so that you could participate in this next agenda item. Board President will move to agenda item 9.6. And at the completion of 9.6, we'll go into the final agenda item other than adjournment, and that is closed session. Thank you. At this point, we will go into go back to agenda item 9.6 discussion and possible action regarding amendment of California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 1426. 
Thank you, um, Dolores. This is Lori, and I will um, do my best to present this. Thank you. Yes, thank you. On um, agenda item 9.6, this has been a um, two items on here that we have combined into one agenda item summary, but I would like to discuss them separately. Um, the first part of the agenda item that um, I do wish to discuss is on 9.6, and that is the requirements for general education courses and how it affects our in-state schools as well as our out-of-state schools. As we've known today in very robust discussions, that um, there are many, many positions open throughout the state for nurses. And as our board president stated that those employers are looking for experienced nurses. What we're running into is um, an issue with 1426. In 1426, that is our um, educational requirements for in-state California RNs. That is also the same educational requirements that our out-of-state RNs are held to. What happens is we will have RNs that are practicing out of state who may have been practicing for 20 years and who may have an advanced degree, who may have gone back and um, received their master's degree. Um, and then they have decided to move and work in California. When they get here and they apply, they do not meet our requirements for licensure because the microbiology that they took in preparation for entering their nursing program did not contain a laboratory component. That is not saying that they didn't take microbiology. It's not saying that they didn't take anatomy and physiology or any of the other the prerequisites or co-requisites that go along with our nursing education. It just means that they didn't have a laboratory component of it. So, what this is, is just a discussion to have within our board members, within the public, to see what their thoughts are on so that we can look at maybe moving forward in the future of writing a regulation that addresses this or requesting legislative updates that um, can uh, write new law that would make an exception for nurses who may have been educated out of state without a microbiology or anatomy and physiology lab um, component that have worked and been licensed for five years or have gone on to get an advanced degree, that those nurses would in fact be able to come in and work in our state. The current process for those nurses that did not have a microbiology with lab or an anatomy physiology with lab um, that are wanting to come into our state is they apply. Our licensing evaluators do a review. Based on that review, they issue them a deficiency. They can at that point apply for a temporary license. The temporary license, they can work as an RN in our state for 6 months. During that 6 month time period, the expectation is, is that they will go back after completing their nursing degree 20 years ago return to school and get a microbiology with lab. When they complete that microbiology with lab, they submit that documentation, they clear up that deficiency. If it takes them longer than six months, those nurses can ask for a one-time extension on a six month temporary license and they can be licensed for an additional six months so they can work in state for one year while they are obtaining that microbiology with lab course. Once they've obtained that course, submitted that documentation, they are then eligible for full licensure within our state and um, can continue to work in California um, without any issues going forward, unless, of course, a disciplinary matter comes up. So this is where I would like to open it up to our board members for you guys to ask questions, to make comments, and really discuss this section, which is the... Um, out of state nurses coming into California 
who were not educated in California with the curriculum that requires a microbiology and anatomy and physiology with lab. Thank you. Well, we're holding up a lot of good nurses because of this requirement. And um, those of us who have had the lab many years ago, I don't want you to be asking me about the lab because I'm not going to be able to tell you anything about it. So I'm not sure what the, why we're holding on to something that probably has no impact on the person as a registered nurse. I agree with you, Betty. This is Imelda. I'm on Betty's phone. I have just a question. I, I mean, I understand the concern. Um, is there a, is there, maybe we can have a, like a mini test uh, and maybe set them to prepare them and, and have them take, take just a mini exam? Um, the exam that they've all taken in past is the national NCLEX. So they've passed the NCLEX exam and they're licensed as an RN. And then any hospital that would hire them would have them provide competencies and would be able to validate them before they would take any patient care. Um, that being said, our educational standards are, are stringent in California. They're, they're that way for a reason. We do hold people to a very high standard in California. And I'd like to say that our nurses are some of the best. We do have um, clinical requirements that are, um, are robust. We additionally have um, nursing theory requirements. We do have a concurrency requirement. These were set up for a reason. Um, and I, I do stand behind them. I was prepared that way myself as an RN in California under these specific education requirements. Um, I, I don't know that a test for microbiology, like a CLEP test is something that um, would be appropriate at this moment because these nurses have been practicing in good standing in other states and have passed the NCLEX. Um, and the one caveat that I'd like to really put out there is that they've met all of the other nursing content requirements. They've had microbio, they've had um, med surge, geriatrics, pediatrics, OB, psych mental health. They've, they've met all of those requirements. So what we're really actually talking about is not the nursing content, but the content required for licensure and that is the microbiology and anatomy physiology with lab. Um, and again, I just want to make clear, they've taken the microbiology, they have taken the anatomy and physiology. The courses that they took in an out of state program did not have the laboratory component. So they've had all the content, they've passed all of the exams, they've um, received their degrees. Um, it's just that they're general education requirement didn't have a laboratory component. Lori, I'm really interested in this whole thing because I mean, I've mean i been doing this now eight years with the board and this is the first time that this has ever come up. And how is it, I mean, I can't even imagine that all the nurses that we have in California have had this lab. Are we, is that something that's checked and everybody who, co who applies for a license? If so, it seems like it is. Hello? Hello? Yes, Betty, to answer your question, um, whenever a applicant applies for license in California through the endorsement process, our licensing staff request transcripts from every single school that they've attended in order to Audio meet these door education closed. requirements. Audio door closed. And um, if they have not proved that through their transcripts that they have met these educational requirements, they are issued deficiencies. This is not a change. Um, this is absolutely something that has been going on for many, many, many years. Um, but we do have new staff at our board. We, uh, I, when, right when the pandemic broke out, um, we hired in a, 
a person that's overseeing board operations. We also hired in a chief of licensing. And with a fresh set of eyes and new people in, these questions have been escalated and I wanted to bring them forward to the board. I'm really, really trying desperately to listen to the board staff and really bring their concerns forward to the board. The, the reason I bring up the person that was hired in board operations is he oversees our public information unit. Our public information unit has been under quite a lot of scrutiny in the last years um, because they are our similar to a call center and they answer our phones and they receive many, many, many phone calls from nurses that are trying to endorse into California and um, are unable to. Additionally, I bring up the chief of licensing because she came from another licensing unit within the state and um, she's been able to work with board operations, our deputy chief of licensing, Christina Sprig, who you're very familiar with and identify some of these areas. And we've been tasked with looking at our endorsement process and really looking at what are the problems and what is the hindrance to having out of state RNs coming into our state. And this is one of them. So um, this is why we're bringing it forward for discussion. If the board agrees to open this up and look at this, um, I will work with our board staff and DCA's regulatory attorneys, and we will look at amending 1426 to um, add a caveat in there for nurses who are prepared out of state to specifically address the microbiology and anatomy and physiology portion of the laboratory part. Not that we don't want them to have A and P and micro. Those are all very, very beneficial and part of the nursing curriculum. So we would still look for that, but that we would make some sort of a, um, an exception based on an advanced degree or based on time in service um, that would allow them to enter into California with an endorsement without having to have a laboratory component. One of the um, big issues that was brought to my attention is our, the person was hired in board ops, um, was receiving phone calls from Arizona State University. And Arizona State University says, why are my students not able to get licensed in California? And so we looked at their nursing curriculum and I quickly identified that their microbiology did not have a laboratory component. So I met with that program director and the board operations person, and we um, had a robust discussion with them and talked about how they would manage their students by putting a notice on their website that would say, if you were interested in a license in California after graduation, that instead of choosing the microbiology that did not have a lab, that they would choose a microbiology with a lab that was offered at their school and then um, go into the nursing program after that. So that was quickly solved with a discussion, but I don't know that we can have a discussion with every single nursing program throughout this, the United States and say, please ensure that all of your students take a microbiology with lab just in case they, they want to move to California. So hopefully that provides some background, how that was discovered and um, really the, the outcry from the endorsement nurses who want to come in out of state that we have blocked them temporarily while they go back to school, complete a microbiology course with lab, and then clear that deficiency that they, so that they can become licensed in California. Lori, this is Jovita. I, I have a question just because uh, that's the first thing that came to my mind is that I know um, I actually work with some of the nurses that went to Arizona, and um, but they lived here, but went to school there. And so my, the reason I'm saying that is I have a question about this. So I totally understand with the nurses, you know, been a nurse for 10, 20 plus years in another state and, and decides to move here. Um, <clears throat> what about the students that their intention is to always come back to California, just as the, um, the school in Arizona was asking? Um, do we have like a time limit? Like, let's say somebody, um, somebody's gets a, um, I don't know, Virginia or, or Florida, a state that doesn't require them to have a lab and it's a recent um, license and they're coming here. 
would we also is it possible to say well since they're more recent or not that don't have that that many years of experience would we would we have like a a, a section on that because the reason I say this because if we're if we're expecting California schools to um, to have the lab and then and then you know word gets out super quick they're gonna say well go here you don't have to do physiology lab and you don't have to do physiology I mean uh, micro lab they're going to, it, it's human nature they're gonna go where it's expected to be less not everybody's like that but it does happen. I don't know if maybe I'm um, asking too much, but what are what are those situations going to entail? There is no prescription as to what this will entail. This is actually just starting the conversation. This is bringing this issue up to our board members so that you guys are aware. Um, as, as Betty said, she's been on our board for eight years. She was not aware of this. And so this is really where I'm doing my due diligence to bring these issues to you guys. Um, there is no path laid out to fix this. Um, this starts with the conversation here. If the board members want me to look into regulatory language that we can work on and update this, I'm more than happy to do that. If you guys would like to give me direction on what you would like me to consider with working on that regulatory language, I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, that's the discussion that I'd like to, to start. Do you guys have a suggestion? Do you think that if you've been in practice for five years and you want to endorse into California, um, that if there's not a microbiology with lab, but you've been working in good standing, equivalent to a full-time RN, um, and you've had no disciplinary action that we can consider them coming in. Or we may say that no, all of them still need to have a microbiology with lab. You may consider changing that only if they've received additional education where they've received an advanced degree, maybe a mic, maybe a master's degree or a um, terminal degree, a PhD or a DNP or, or something to that sort. Um, that may be something that you consider. So I, I'm opening it up to you guys. I'd like to know what the impact of having the lab or not having the lab it has on their ability to practice as a nurse. So if I may speak to that, I just don't um, see it, that they that it's even needed. Uh, I I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt anybody, but um, I I do. Um, I do feel that that is needed because um, we learn that certain certain antibiotics, you know, and that and that can take it into a different step. But we need to know where we are with the, you know, are they gram negative positive? Are they, you know, positive or negative? It it does have, it, it does. It, it's also um, uh, sorry, I'm mumbling, but. It does have a, a urgency for people to have that, but then here's what I'm saying. Um, I was saying to Miss Lori is that um, people that have been nurses for, you know, I'm saying 10 because that's, you know, but it could be five. They acquire that knowledge, but if it's somebody that's novice and we're expecting them to practice safely, I think, I think it, it is, it is, there's a reason why California asks for labs for physiology and for micro. And at first it's, it's hard. Cause I, I mean, I still remember going through those classes and they're not easy. Um, and the lab, the lab is part of it just as in, um, I know we're going to be talking about the hours of actual patient, um, patient actually not sim, but actually touching a patient, touching, you know, uh, seeing what is it that they're assessing for it, it's it's not the same i know it's apples and oranges but there's a reason why um why we need to have that lab component to us it's not just about learning all those organisms um you know covid is one because even though we've taken microbiology many many years ago um i had to relearn like okay so what does covid really entail and how is it attacking everything in our body, it's not just our lungs, it's everything is it's perfusing. What does it perfuse? It perfuses our heart, our abdomen area, 
our GI, I mean, it's, we learned a lot. Even though I've been a nurse 29 years, I learned enormous amount and I'm still learning about COVID, how it's affecting because this, I mean, five years later, we're going to know more about COVID than we do now, even though we've been two years going on two years out of COVID or, you know, reaching it. So, okay. um, uh, I, you know, just uh, to finish my saga, I mean, I totally understand if they've been a nurse for five, if we want to say, if we want to cap, cap it at five, definitely DMPs, they do an enormous amount of, even if they didn't take a lab, they're going to learn a lot about that. The DMPs, masters, like if they go, you know, I mean, some of the masters, I know that their focus is different. I don't know if we want to do that umbrella, but I'm open to it. But I definitely think that if like recency, they should have a lab. And I know that a person actually uh, reached out and to, um, I think more to myself, but other board members about how frustrating it was to retake the lab component to micro, but, you know, she was starting out. I mean, I totally feel for her and the frustration because I too have been hung up after being on an hour and that was over the fingerprint. So my stress level was shot up to the roof too um, over that because I thought I was compliant and I guess I, you know, needed to do fingerprints. But that aside, I, I don't mean to um, harp anymore, but uh, there is a reason for our lab. For microbiology and physiology. I agree with you, Hobita. And that, that goes back to what we've said many, many times where theory builds on lab and clinical and lab and clinical builds on theory. You need to have that symbiotic relationship to really put it into practice. Um, I think you, you spoke on that very, very well. Um, we can continue the discussion with our board members, um, but this might be something that's actually a really good thing to um, Bring out to public comment and see if anybody has any any comments. Um, I know this is one agenda item. I want to break it out into agenda the first one. Um, have that go to public comment. Start a conversation on that before we go into the second part of it. Uh, Lori, I think at the beginning of this, you indicated I said something about a mini test or something, and you said that the schools already do that. They have tests in place when they hire somebody. So the hospitals, I, 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 yeah, the hospitals. Well, you know, the hospitals are already doing that, and maybe there's other uh, facilities that aren't. If we could just do like a a, a mini course, um, you know, again, uh, someone that has been practicing for over five years um, probably just needs a a refresher, and we can maybe implement that. But my suggestion uh, would be to this board for you to. Look at the, um, you know, do some research and, and bring us back some, you know, what if we do this, what, you know, something, um, I, I, I think we have to look outside of the box, um, and start thinking differently. So I, my recommendation is for you to, uh, come back to us and, you know, give us some, some suggestions, you know, some scenarios. But with that, um, I, I think we should hear from the public and see what they have to say. Imelda, if I could speak to that, I could only speak to my hospital and I do teach in other hospitals in my area, but um, we can't leave it to the hospitals to do that. Um, one, because everybody's exam is going to be different. And I know that I've taken the exam. Of course, things have changed, you know, especially talking about insulins alone is different. But their test is nothing compared to what you go through in microbiology and physiology lab. Yeah, the what the healthcare facilities do upon hire is they do a competency test on many things that's hands on. Um, they're watching those nurses and each one of their skills. They, they do a competency to make sure that they um, can do that because our scope of practice in BPC 2725 is only based on competency. It's a very broad scope of practice and we can absolutely do that as long as they're competent. Um, the test that you're kind of talking about Imelda rings kind of very similar to me as a CLEP exam, um, but with the CLEP test, those are administered through our schools um, and the CLEP test would, if passed, give credit for microbiology and lab um, within that academic institution. 
again, um, the board doesn't offer the club testing and that would be have to be managed through our academic partners. So, um, again, this is just to bring this considerate this. Um, very, very, very big issue forward for discussion amongst our board and then direction from you guys, how you would like to proceed. Would you like me to look out um, updating our regulations? Again, remember yesterday when we were talking about AB 890 and the implementation of that, each one of the changes that we do through regulation does need to be evidence based and we do have to have that. So um, with that, if I, if you guys do want me to open up and look at regulation, anything that we put forward would be evidence based would come back to this board for review and comment and um, before any kind of regulatory package moved. Lori, I have That's a question. question. That's a good start. Lori, I have a question. Do we have an idea of how many states require this or not? I don't off the top of my head. I do have each state's requirements and that their board approves their education. Um, what happens when those boards of nursing approve the education for their um, academic partners within their state? What they do is the same thing that we do is we make them eligible to test. So we let NCSBN know, or sorry, Pearson View know that they've been eligible to test. So they've cleared that board's um, requirements. And then NCSBN through Pearson View will, it will provide the NCLEX examination if they pass. It goes back to that board and that board then license them. Each one of our states have their own education requirements and um, licensing requirements. And that's why we do the endorsement processes where um, a what we talked about yesterday with the nurses and license verification is if they're licensed in one state, they that nurse will go to the next state, say, I want to work here, find out what is required to be licensed in that state, evaluate whether or not they've met those requirements, and if they have, then apply. And then we verify their license and they um, meet those requirements. So that is an individual process through every board um, throughout the nation. And I, I can't speak to each one of their education requirements. I can only truly speak to ours. Well, it, it might be something that we need to know. Just personally, uh, I can query NCSBN. Um, I could put out a survey and ask if how many um, nursing state, how many states require microbiology with lab. Um, as with any of these surveys that go out to the state boards of nursing, not all of them answer, um, but I can ask for that and I could bring that information back to you guys. Thank you. Comments? Lori, do you do you need a motion from us? Um, I, I mean, again, I, I've already stated that I would like you to ex explore uh, regulatory change um, and report back to you know what is it that you information data uh, you know evidence based or whatever. What yeah, do you need no, from Belda, us? I I don't need a motion from you. You've given me direction. This has been a really great conversation. I wanted to bring it to light and start this conversation. Um, what I will do is I will work with my, um, my board staff and I will work with, um, DCA's regulatory attorneys and we will see if we can come up with some regulatory language. When I bring that regulatory language to the board, that is when I would need a motion. That is okay, when I would need you guys to accept that so that we can go into the regulatory process identically to what you guys did yesterday with AB 890 and the regulations with that. We brought that forward. You accepted it. Now we can start that. So I will work on language, bring it to you, and we'll move that. But I would like to open it up to public comment for this section of this agenda item so that we can hear more on that if that's something that you guys will agree to. Thank you. Yes, Board good. moderator, can you open it up for public comment on the number one of 9.6? The comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment.
please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in I would like to make a comment. Kathy Hughes would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Kathy. Hi, this is Kathy Hughes. I'm a registered nurse and the director of the Nurse Alliance of SEIU California. Um, obviously, the nurses haven't made, taken a position yet on um, the exact regulatory change, but I think we would be very interested in looking into the possibilities of a regulatory change that is very specific and limited, um, especially since it could address some of our nursing shortage and um, address some of the problems we've had getting nurses from out of state that have many years of experience, experience to, uh, to be able to practice here in California, while at the same time not undermining our current education system and creating a two-tiered system. Thank you. Thank you. BJ Bartleson would like to make a comment. Go ahead, BJ. Clinical services at the California Hospital Association. I find this discussion fascinating and agree with a lot of the board members' questions. And it's, um, we would totally support any type of um, evidence um, review of the uh, situation, particularly from our experts in the academic field. I mean, I'm sort of flabbergasted, but I have been a nurse for 43 years and had labs in every which way. But I think we need to understand, is, is that necessary now? Why, why are schools not offering labs with the basic sciences? It seems odd to me, but maybe there's something we don't know. So one of the things you might contemplate um, would be some type of a hearing that the BRN puts on that we bring our academic experts that we talk about. Is this still an important piece of our academic um, background to be a nurse? I would say yes, but I'm 43 years into it and maybe not so much. Think about simulation. Think about academic transformation. So point being totally support. Um, we definitely need to fix our endorsement process and if this this is a way to do it um, relative to changing the regulations to make exceptions i would want to make sure that happens based on evidence and science that it's okay to do it that it's that's not required after you have certain years of practice or it is required at a certain time i think it would be very difficult to say you have to have five years of practice 10 years of practice an advanced degree what if you have an advanced degree like i have in administration so and I think there's going to be a lot of caveats, but I think it would be well worth our while to have a, a hearing, bring uh, experts uh, to talk about it, for us to hear more about all of the questions that we've had. Thank you. BJ, would this be something that would be beneficial to be d discussed within the NEWAC committee? Absolutely. I was going there next and I didn't Wonderful. forget. It's a perfect place to have that discussion and for the NEWAC experts, um, to get all of this background information and answer the questions that we've had um, and then bring it back to the board or even bring it back to a hearing where all nurses can come and listen and, and buy in or, you know, ask questions. I sit, at the, I sit at the Board of Pharmacy and when there's new things happening in the field, they have an open hearing and the experts present their position and then everybody listens and they ask questions and then the board's able to go back uh, and make some uh, good decisions based on evidence. So thanks. Wonderful, thank you. And BJ, this is this is not directed towards you. Uh, just a friendly reminder that please keep your comments to two minutes. Alice Benjamin would like to make a comment. Go ahead, Alice. Hi everyone, my name is Alice Benjamin. I am an advanced practice nurse. I'm a clinical nurse specialist and family nurse practitioner currently working in primary care. I've been adjunct faculty and I still do work in the ER and ICU as a registered nurse. Um, I believe that you know if other states have been able to license their nurses um, and they've been able to practice without a lab component, I believe that is the lesson learned in that. Um, considering when I went back to school, I've been a nurse for 23 years, you know, with technology, with video, with so there's so many 
other ways to learn the material from that you would get from a laboratory component now that we can visualize and teachers can record, see, and do. I think that there may be uh, an opportunity here to um, update our some of our practices while not losing some of that education. So I just feel like um, as someone who's still very much at the bedside, working with travelers, working with, you know, really at the front lines and hearing these conversations around you know, gram positive, gram negative, and all these other things that we're talking about, I think there is an opportunity to um, make uh, it easier for nurses to come to California to practice, provided they've passed their NCLEX, they've ba passed that competency, and I think we need to be open to that. Thank you. Judy Corliss would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead. And um, I echo the last uh, many comments. Um, I know that maybe we have something that we don't do that might be required in other states. So we could ask NCSBN about that. Uh, and do they take our nurses reciprocity? Uh, there have been some things over the years. I remember Bobby Pierce used to uh, take a look at all of these applications that come from everywhere else and make some decisions. So I never heard this either, having served on the board for several years. And, um, you know, the requirements now may, to pass the NCLEX, there may not be questions about microbiology specifically, except you need to know the theory of it. And maybe that's the theory of the other uh, states that if you know the theory of microbiology, and you didn't have a lab, you might be using that in your practice. And if you're competent, then I would say we should maybe give reciprocity to the competent nurses trying to come in. So again, everybody else has put in very good input and I'd be willing to help or stand, you know, for all of those uh, comments that have been made. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Alice Martinegra. Marta, Marta Nagara would like to make a comment. One second, please. Good afternoon. Um, this is Alice Marta Nagara, and uh, from being uh, as a registered nurse and as well as an academician, uh, you know, I've um, I'm a nursing director and a dean, and I've managed uh, programs from an associate degree programs to a master's level programs. And the reason nurses take microbiology with lab here in California in our pre-licensure program is to for nurses to understand the mode of spread of infection. As Ms. Yovida had mentioned earlier in regards to COVID and other means and sources of infection, uh, you know, one of our roles as a registered nurse is understanding the role of immunization to control threats of various disease. And because of that, the main purpose of the lab is to assist in the diagnosis of the infectious disease. And because of these um, premise of, uh, we call it prerequisite to the nursing program or to the nursing core piece of the education, the first semester students, they are in going to be assessing and learning how to complete physical assessment. So if we are talking about seasoned nurses who have um, many, many years of experience or advanced degrees, like Ms. Lori had mentioned, perhaps there may be an equitable uh, challenge exam or something like that, or if they can prove they've taken advanced pathophysiology in their MSN programs or NP programs, that would be amendable to deem competency. But for novice nurse to transfer without a microbiology lab component, that is also putting the patient or the public at risk if they don't understand how to diagnose infectious disease. Thank you for listening to my comment. Thank you. Board President Melby, there are no other public requests for comment. Would you like me to close that window? 
Dolores. Um, <laughs> board president. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry. E.O. Melby, board president for Helia. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want Dolores' job. <laughs> at all. Well, I got I got a, a notice and, and it said board president, and I'm like, what? And then, ah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. No worries. Dolores. <laughs> You want to uh, close yes. public comment and we'll go on to the second section of 9.6. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So the second section of 9.6 is an incredibly controversial topic that our board has only talked about in um, uh, the legislative sections of this, where our board has vehemently opposed um, and I'm bringing this forward on request of our uh, vice president, Mary Fagan. I am upset that she is not here to be part of this discussion as I think she would um, really uh, enjoy those conversations. She would. The reason I bring this up is I was at the COADN, CACN meeting in October. And I gave a presentation about the updates to our board. And I talked about our new uh, processing of our California grad apps and um, it was received very well and everybody was happy. And then one of the nursing directors said, you, you're doing so well. I would like you to um, answer this. She said that we now have proof that 50% simulation works because we've been operating with 50% simulation for COVID um, and so I'd like to open that back up. My response to her was, we do not have proof that 50% works. And I explained to her why. And our nursing programs each have their own curriculum. They do not have a standardized curriculum. The other thing that I want you guys to take into consideration that in our current regulation right now, we require 18 units of clinical or 27 quarter units, sorry, 18 semester units of clinical or 27 quarter units of clinical. What we don't say is what they have to be in. So what we've had throughout COVID and what my NECs have gone through with our program directors has been quite hefty. The first thing that we did when COVID hit in um, March of last year was we looked at our programs. They've been really, really complaining about not having enough clinicals and having experienced clinical displacement. We heard that today as well, where our community colleges made a cry for help saying that the private colleges are coming in and the community colleges are being displaced because they offer the associate degrees and the other ones offer bachelor's degrees and the hospitals are choosing the bachelor's degree prepared nurses over the associate degree prepared nurses because they want a magnet status. What we found out when we pulled all of the curriculum and mind you individual curriculums from every single pre licensed nursing program throughout the state of California, whether they're ADN, BSN or ELM, is that although the BRN set the minimum at 18 units, there was only about 25% of the schools that were actually only offering the minimum. What that meant is that out hundreds of hours were spent out in the clinical site that were not needed for licensure. When talking to the program directors, they weren't willing to decrease those hours because what that did was affect their faculty load. When you decrease the units that a faculty member teaches, it, it affects their pay. It affects their compensation. And that is something that we obviously do not want to have an effect on. What also was brought up is that when we did these reviews and we were moving curriculum around because OB and PEDS and psych mental health was very difficult to manage, we were moving that to a later semester, hoping that those clinical sites would open up. Some schools wanted three units in OB for clinicals. Some students wanted, some schools wanted two units in OB for clinicals. And some schools wanted one unit, one and a half units in OB for clinicals. And then others had um, curriculum that have all of these units combined. 
And so when you look at that and you look at the, the math with that, it, it skews the data. We cannot say that a school that has three units of OB clinical labs that gives 50% is the same as a school that has only one and a half units in OB and we get 50%. So what NCSBN is doing, and I, I hear what was said earlier today where people are really talking about, you know, we need to be more in alignment with what NCSBN does. NCSBN is doing a research study on looking at a minimum direct patient care. They're no longer looking at the 50% simulation. What's happening right now is they did a study in 2016 on from NCSBN on their original study from 2013. And that study stated that that 50% was only data collected on schools that had a minimum clinical requirement of 600 hours. So in order for California to make any movement they need to establish a minimum. We do not have a minimum of 600 hours required for our students to be in clinicals. And so without having a minimum of 600 hours required as clinical for our students, we can't do apples to apples and look at the NCSBN study and say 50% works because we don't have the same data. So. I'm going to pull up a form here really quick um, just for me to be able to talk to you about numbers so that you guys can kind of understand what I'm saying a little bit more. If you have an art curriculum in 1426 G2 gives a um, mathematical equation, and in that equation, that's how the hours are decided. And so that there is something that we need to look at as well. So if I have a semester that is 16 weeks in nature and I have a laboratory component that is three units, I am required to do 144 hours in clinicals. That's without doing the 75% in direct patient care. When I'm doing the 75% in direct patient care, that means I am completing 108 hours in that clinical. But like I said, our schools have their own curriculum. And so if we have a school that has two units, they're only required to do 96 hours of clinicals. And so if I do 75% of the 96 hours, those students are only required to complete 72 hours at 50%. Now say I have a class that is one and a half. My one and a half unit for clinical is 72 hours. And I take that 72 hours and I do 75%. I'm only required to do 54 hours. So do you see how this 50% talk does not work for California because we do not have a baseline established. So if I were to say right now that we need to move to a 50% simulation, that means the school that has a three unit lab in OB, their students with 75% is only required to do 108 hours. The student that is taking a class in another section of our state that only has a one and a half unit OB component is only required to do 54 hours. That is 54 hours less than the other student that has that other curriculum that is designed. California Board of Registered Nursing approves curriculums. We do not design curriculum. We only look at, do they meet the content required for licensure? So I hear the call from this board. I hear that the board wants to do more for our nurses and our nursing students. That is not the answer to do a simulation when we don't have a baseline. We need to establish a baseline like NCSBN said. NCSBN said right now that 600 hours is what was used in that study. Maybe that's our first move is opening up to that. I, I don't know. I want to start those conversation because I really want to make sure that people understand that a 50% simulation, although that is what's been thrown at us many, many, many years, can't work unless we establish a baseline. The other thing that I do want to share with you is I went on to NCSBN and I pulled data and within NCSBN, I wanted to let you guys know that 
Um, there are states that have gone um, to not doing a 50% SIM and not opining on SIM at all. And in fact, all they've done is say, we believe that patient safety and student preparation is truly defined by hands-on clinical experiences. And so those hands-on clinical experience, because we are only doing public protection, and that's our focus, and that's what our board has been continually is, is the public protection, um, and that is our, our focus, that's why we're here, is they just look at um, a uh, minimum direct patient care. When I brought that up at COADN, they were interested, CACN as well, they were interested at that meeting. Because what that allows is exactly what our program directors have been asking for. What they've been asking for is they want more autonomy. They want to do what their program needs. And that they say that our board does not know what their program needs. I think we have a good understanding but I absolutely believe that the program directors know their program better than us. There are many, many studies out there that talk about simulation not being effective for the minority students. And in fact, they do horror with the more simulation that they have. We also have schools that we've brought forth, um, such as ELAC, LA City College, who we have proven repeatedly with our NECs that they don't have the resources that they need to be able to hire in faculty, to train the faculty, to be able to manage these um, simulation components. And so simulation is only as good as the faculty that are trained to deliver it. They need to have that training, they need to do that. And some of our schools do not have the funding available for that. So making a one size fits all for our programs is not equitable and not the answer. So what I did when I went on to NCSBN is I looked and I said, what, what um, states are, are moving forward? And so I can say that Washington, Oregon, DC, Colorado are established a minimum patient care of 500 hours to 750 hours. And I, they, they only give a range. I can get the specifics if you guys need me to. Hawaii requires greater than 1,000 hours. Kentucky, Virginia requires 751 to 1,000 hours. Um, Rhode Island, Vermont, they're under 500. We have no schools throughout the nation in any of the states that require less than 250 hours of clinical. Um, so I'm asking us, we've been talking today many, many times about changing education, changing the preparation of our students and really looking at answering the call. Um, California cannot go to a 50% SIM because it's 50% of what? If we really are looking at public protection, we need to establish a, a, what that 50% of is. And honestly, so the, and I've done a lot of education today and yesterday about our regulations. There is no regulation that we have that talks about simulation. We do not regulate simulation. We have no oversight on simulation whatsoever. We only regulate direct patient care. What it states in 1426 G2, and I'm trying to pull that up to you, is with the exception of the first course, that the remaining courses, and I'm, I'm just going off the top of my head here, but I really do wanna read it to you guys, so I'm just waiting for my computer to catch up with me. So 1426 G2 says, with the exception of an initial nursing course that teaches basic nursing skills in a skills lab, 75% of the clinical hours in a course must be in direct patient care in the area specified in section 1426D. You guys heard from the one program director on here that said, my students will be entering in the spring, they enter into their first semester, they're not out in the clinicals. 
That's correct. The fundamentals of nursing course does not require any hands on care. That can be 100% done in the lab. They're in compliance with our regulations. It's only the additional classes of med surge, OBP, psych, mental health, and Jerry that require 50%. But again, I want to take you back to the, the fundamental issue of that is it's 75% of what? We have 18 total units for the entire content required for licensure. That can be 10 units in med surge. And then it could be one unit in OB, two units in PEDS, three units in Jerry, and three units in psych mental health. There's, there is no standard. I'm not here to say we need to establish a, a standard curriculum. I think we tried that in 2009 um, with the California curriculum model, and um, that, that didn't work too well. Um, but I really would like to allow our program directors the autonomy that they want to really address the needs of their demographic and to work within the confines of the resources that they have. The Board of Registered Nursing can establish a minimum direct patient care hour requirement, and that's it. That will allow the schools to do 25% in SIM, 50% in SIM, 75% in SIM. It's very similar, Betty. I'm sure you're familiar with the regulation in 1484 that is for nurse practitioners. And um, we actually talked about that yesterday as well in this meeting where we read out the educational requirements for 1484 for our nurse practitioners. And that's exactly what we did. We did exactly what we're talking about right now. And in 1426, G or H, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it. It says that the program shall meet the minimum of 500 clinical hours of supervised direct patient care experiences. That's a very simple statement, and that might be something that we look at for our pre licensure. Align that with our APRN. And if we give them a minimum, of supervised direct patient care experiences that they need to meet. They can do whatever they want over and above that in simulation in any percentage that they choose to do with the faculty loads that they have and the resources that we have. And we do not have to, we do not have any regulatory authority over simulation and we can keep it that way. When you start to open up the, the Pandora's box with simulation, I talked to Vince Chi who is a staff member of um, Evan Lowe. And he was working on AB 2288. And um, he made mention that he was not able to get the stakeholders to come to an agreement on what was needed in simulation. And so what they wrote into that bill for us to follow a simulation is, and I will read it, the substitute clinical practice hours not in direct patient care that are simulation experiences are based on the best practices published by the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, the National Council of the State Boards of Nursing, the Society for Simulation in Healthcare, or equivalent standards approved by the board. That is because those are three amazing, amazing simulation partners, but they're all three different. And as long as they were based on the best practices of each one of them, a student, a school could use them. Additionally, they wrote in or equivalent standards approved by the board, and that's because they could not come to an agreement. And so I think that if we were to look at adopting in updating our regulations that we can use a very similar statement as the one in 1484 that we do for the um, nurse practitioners where we talk about a minimum standard for direct patient care and then we make mention that any of the additional hours that are used to meet the clinical objectives that are in simulation that, are, that they are based on the best practices published by the International Nursing Association of Clinical Simulation and use that line that 
um, Vince Chi and Evan Lowe gave us in AB 2288 that is now 2186.3. So I would like to really kind of have the board consider us looking into the evidence. I do know that the National Councils of State Boards of Nursing um, are doing a very robust study on the clinicals through COVID minimum standards. And I think that that's something that would be great for us to, to bring up. And I think that this topic again would be another great topic for NEWAC to really kind of talk about and explore very similar to this last topic. And that was one of the reasons why that advisory committee is um, needed and uh, can be reinstated and, and worked with next year. Um, we do need to adjust our standards in California. We do need to keep patient safety at our forefront. And I firmly believe that the direct patient care is really the only thing that our board ever needs to really kind of opine on because that is what our board has said routinely that that's what we believe is the best. And then our schools can have the autonomy to do whatever they want over and above our minimum requirement. And that way we can stop arguing about 25% SIM, 50% SIM and take that off the table going forward. And our programs will be able to have the autonomy that they want to have to choose what's best for their school and their resources. Thank you. Lori, what questions about? Go ahead, Betty. I'll go after you. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously there's a huge problem here that we have to address not only on the amount of simulation, but also the amount of clinical hours. My question is clinical hours, how, however they are going to be determined. Is there anything that says that I'll use an example. So many have to be in peak, so many have to be in OBGYN, so many has to be in psych. So the clinical. No, okay. we have nothing that says that each program has their own curriculum. Some programs do 2 units. Some programs do 3 units. And I could honestly tell you that there were many, many minor curriculum changes throughout COVID where the schools that had these hard to fill clinical spaces for OBPs and psych mental health. The 1st thing they did was look at those specialty areas and decrease the units so that they can decrease the hours that their students needed so that they would be able to progress and graduate. We have no minimum standard. Obviously, they need to have some classes in these various uh, specialties, but in, my question is, are they all necessary to have any clinical hours in? And can, for instance, somebody may, be wanting to be a nurse, they have no interest at all in, in GYN. So why have those hours for um, clinical hours in that specialty? Maybe they need to take more in med surge or in psych or something else. I'm just throwing it out there. I don't have certainly I'm just thinking about it all myself about. Yeah, I hear, I hear you on that, Betty. Um, I can give some input. As a nursing education consultant, we really talked within our schools about getting out of the silos and seeing how everybody worked off each other and how the specialties complemented the med surge. Um, if you were to graduate and work in the ER, any pregnant person that is less than 20 weeks comes into the ER for care. It's after 20 weeks that they go to the labor and delivery unit. Additionally, once they deliver, if there is any kind of infection that occurs post delivery, um, they come back to the ER. And so that nurse that's working in the R ER absolutely has to have some OBGYN um, something within their, their, their program. Say you're gonna work in an outpatient surgery center, there, there are um, pregnant people that need to have their tonsils removed. There are pregnant people, very common, to, they get gallstones and they have to have their gallbladder removed. You need to be able to know how to manage that person in the OBGYN aspect as well as that medical surgical component. You have to be 
minimally diverse in any of the areas so that you can be a holistic nurse. That is the real big point that we put out in nursing is that we are holistic. We manage the patient from birth, from pre-birth, you know, conception to, to, to post-mortem. They'll, they'll all have people say that, well, I don't need to do psych. There is not a single patient that we see that does not have a psychiatric component, whether that be the use of therapeutic communication, whether that be managing anxiety because they are now in the hospital in a strange location that we were not aware of, whether they came in as a victim of trauma or sexual assault, we now have to manage them from a psychiatric standpoint, whether they have a diagnosis or not. That is something we absolutely need to have. So that specialty is pivotal as well. You ask about the specialty of pediatrics. I can tell you that when I worked in ICU, the age limit for the lowest age for me was 16. 16 year olds are pediatric patients and I had 16 year olds in my ICU. When I worked in the emergency room, we would always joke and say that it turns into a pediatric clinic after five o'clock and on weekends because the pediatric offices are closed. I absolutely needed pediatrics. When I worked in labor and delivery, I delivered a baby on a 12 year old. I needed pediatrics. And when I worked in sexual assault nursing, I was an adult sexual assault nurse, but my adult age started at age 16. And so I did receive clients that came in that were 16 years old that had been sexually assaulted. I needed to manage them from a growth and development standpoint of a pediatric patient and not an adult. Absolutely, as a well-rounded nurse, I have been required to use each one of those specialties, pediatrics, obstetrics, geriatrics, and psych, as I managed patients in the emergency room, in the med surge unit, in an outpatient surgery center. We, we need all of these in order to be a well-rounded competent nurse so that we can then go in and specialize. Well, I'm, I'm not suggesting that nurses shouldn't learn about these special specialty area. I'm just questioning how much time, since we seem to be de decreasing the amount of student time with direct patient care, I'm just questioning how much time in those various specialties is enough or not enough, or do they need it or not? Obviously, they need to know about all of this stuff, but uh, once you start doing direct patient care, are you getting enough time in any of these subspecialties? Well, they're all specialties. Let's, let's look at it like that. Are you getting enough time in these areas? that makes any difference in your practice? That's my question. I just question, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I hear you, Betty. And, and I think that goes to with one of, one of the previous nursing program directors today said is um, they said they're hiring new grads straight into their hospital into all of their specialty areas. So they're coming in ready to take a patient in pediatrics without doing med surge first ready to take a patient in obstetrics without doing med surge first, going directly into ICU. Um, these are things that we need to look at because we are absolutely changing the way that nursing nurses are employed after graduation and the way that nurses are prepared during school. They're going out and they're feeling this demand that is being shared with us without any additional training by the schools um, and they're going in ready to take care of patients within those healthcare facilities. I used to be a clinical nurse educator um, in a hospital setting right before coming to the board. And I had to extend my new grad program from three months to six months because the, stu the school, the nurses that I was hiring were not ready to take the patients that I had at the hospital. And we were even considering a, a lengthening it to a one year residency because they were not prepared. And that doesn't mean, that wasn't just ADN. I had entry level master nurses that had just graduated as well and BSNs. It was not different from the different degree types. And then that's one thing also I want to, to make sure that the board is aware of. We do not manage degree types at our board. We don't have anything that has anything to do with degrees. We did um, only go to 
um, licensing requirements. And so I wanted to kind of make that specifically clear. Did you get the answer to your question, Betty? It wasn't an answer to the question. I just uh, thinking through different things. That's what I was throwing out. I so per se that I'm looking for right now. Any other questions or comments from the board? I definitely agree that the more um, clinical hours spent at the bedside with the human being is much more valuable than not that I don't agree with Sims. Sims are, are a great tool, but I believe that we need to have the student um, more hours in, in at the bedside. Thank you for that, Jovita. Right now, I can let you know with our current regulation, the way that it's written, our minimum direct patient care can fluctuate between 540 hours and 864 hours because we do not have a standard that is set. So I'm, I'm asking our board to look at making a standard of the minimum amount of direct patient care so that our nursing schools can do what they have the resources to do to use a simulation to complement that. Um, but right now, with having the variation between 540 hours and 864 hours, if we were to say 50% sim, that would not be an answer to anything. Because if it's 50% of 864 hours, then, sorry about that, guys. That's 432 hours of direct patient care and 432 hours of simulation. But if it is 50% of 540 hours, that's 270 hours of direct patient care and 270 hours of simulation. So again, as a board, I don't think we need to opine on simulation. We don't have it in our regulation. We've never had authority over simulation. What we need to look at is establishing a minimum direct patient care so that our schools can do what they have the ability to support, whether it be 25% or 50% of simulation, that's up to the schools, but we have set the standard with the minimum direct patient care. I know that I'm happy to say that we're at the 864 um, at the school at heart now, but um, from experience, the student is even something as simple as uh, teaching them a skill um, at the, um, in the skills, um, day and then they come and you know we sign them off and then they come to the bedside and and i know that they test it out in skills and then they can't even do it at the bedside it's definitely a value to do things at the bedside i see it with this you know and it doesn't it doesn't matter um you know how, you know on their test scores it, it could be a valedictorian or a student that's you know making the c mark it's it's the bedside is so different. It is and simulation helps. It really does. Robust simulation is amazing. When I started my PhD program back in 2009 um, and just to be completely transparent, I only completed a year of that. I did not complete my PhD, but in that one year, my dissertation was actually going to be on the use of simulation. I actually went to KT Waxman's classes um, and she was an idol of mine. I do see the benefit of simulation 100%, but we can't do an establishment of any type of simulation in California because we don't have a baseline. And the studies that NCSBN puts out says that every single one of them that they did was based on 600 or more clinical hours. So that's really where our board needs to start. And we need to establish a baseline of direct patient care and truly as being an NEC and going from all of the schools throughout the state and seeing the differences in resources, the difference in faculty and the differences in the ability for them to run a sim lab. We had one person on here that talked about today that they had a virtual reality sim lab. That's yeah. fantastic. That's incredibly different than the community college that has a low fidelity um, pelvis that is in a um, bed that they're practicing um, doing a Foley on. 
So um, we need to understand that each one of our schools have varying resources, varying reports of faculty and training, and we need to stay out of that simulation. That is a for-profit entity, 100%, um, and we just need to establish the minimum patient safety, which would be a direct patient care standard. So where do we go from here? We open it up to public comment, and then as we did with the number one on this, we take this information, we bring it to NEWAC, we start working on regulations, and um, we bring it back to the board and see what the board wants to do. I get gather evidence. We look at what NCSBN has to look at for a minimum direct patient care, and we stop the conversation and the battles about 25% SIM and 50% SIM, because that's not something we're ever gonna be able to agree on. Um, our board and um, the bedside nurses truly believe that the hands-on practice is the end-all be-all, but our academicians have an amazing point, and that is that simulation complements. Simulation helps them pull all that together, and that's fantastic, they can do that. We as a board need to stay out of that and we can establish a direct patient care and we can let our schools do what they have the resources to do and give them that autonomy to do 25% or 50%. However, they want to build their faculty loads and however they want to build their curriculum to accommodate. So, Lori, um, just as a question, would we start at 864? 864 is what we have today. That is the direct patient. No, sorry. That is the clinical hour requirement. Our 75% in direct patient care is what I said. It ranges for each school from being 540 hours to being 648 hours. They, they fall within that. There are some schools that are giving 540 hours of direct patient care. There are some schools that are doing 100 hours more than that of direct patient care, and that's 648. There are some schools that are doing well above that because they've increased their units because that's what they choose to do. Um, so we don't have a minimum starting point. The Smiley report that is from NCSBN said 600 hours, and they would go from there. But I, I read to you guys as well as the information from the other boards um, some of them have some as low as 500 hours as a direct patient care standard. I know that that has been something that we've talked about as well, but I would like to gather more evidence and um, wait for the NCSBN report that comes out in the spring and really look at establishing a safe direct patient care hour requirement and let the simulation conversation stop because it's really not about the board to oversee simulation. We don't. We only oversee direct patient care and we can do our public protection by setting a minimum direct patient care hour requirement. So we talked about taking this to MEWAC. Do we need any recommendations or motions no. or anything from the board? No motion, no recommendation. Um, I would like to hear from the public though at this yeah, point. Yeah, let's open BR and moderator. Can you please open for public comment? The comment now, I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Board President, just a quick reminder, Dolores, that we will be stopping public comment at 4 p.m. today to go into closed session. Um, that was a yes. request for our legal counsel is to go into closed session at 4 o'clock. So it is 324 right now. If public comment continues for a while, we will have a hard stop at 4 o'clock to enter into, into closed session.
Thank you. Alice Montenegro. Montenegara would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Alice. Okay, good, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my comment. Um, as uh, an academic dean, um, having served at both, uh, you know, uh, private and public entities, I can tell you um, simulation is very important if we do it correctly. Um, here uh, in my current program at a community college, um, the faculty who are content experts, which actually meets the regulation requirements for faculty to have a content expert in the five areas of geriatric, med search, OBPs, and mental health, they do complement their teaching, not just with a skills lab, but also with using different modalities of simulation or any other non-direct care. They do that um, above and uh, the 25%, as everybody has said, uh, because they use their classroom time to also do simulation, where they do lecture at the bedside sometimes with scaffolding their, their curriculum or their course uh, content. So we teach theory. We do active teaching where you flip the classroom, you bring them into the simulation lab, have them re, uh, uh, have the students go through the scenario, and then we scaffold them once they're exposed to those areas or opportunities that they may not see in the hospital, like a fall or an isolation patient because of COVID, our students are not allowed in isolation areas, then they are more successful in the direct patient care. So they don't do harm to our patients. Um, first semester, we know that skills is all they need and they don't, they're not required by the board regulations to have clinical hours. However, in first semester, we do have them learn physical assessment and PO med medication administration. Now, if we never expose them into any days at all, and this is not the whole semester, but just a few days of hospital experience where they actually do administer a PO medication without any harm to the patient and understanding the, the rights of the medication, then we are successful in progressing them to the following semester where they do the 75% direct care. So please, uh, I do support Ms. Lori's uh, recommendation for. Um, uh, a standardized uh, minimum clinical hours. Um, thank you. Thank you. Alice Benjamin would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Alice. CNS, a nurse practitioner and adjunct faculty. Um, one of the things that I've done, especially in my role as a clinical nurse specialist, is that I have been responsible for the onboarding and training of new graduates, as well as new to specialty, and those who have been practicing nurses, as well as the new residents um, in critical care and ICU. And I have found simulation um, helpful as an adjunct. But in my, in my um, uh, time as clinical faculty at nursing schools, um, and I'll say this, we like we 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 want to think very highly of all of our nursing schools. They all mean the best. But just as there are variations in healthcare services, there are variations in the quality of nursing education. So when you don't have these staff who are properly trained, not just how to use the technology, but to create the clinical scenarios that are important for nurses, student nurses, it becomes more of a something to do on a checklist is checking off the hours. There really is no quality of that. And that without naming the schools, I will be honest and say I have seen situations in which simulation has been a joke. I'm just saying this very honestly, and I'm saying this because of public safety. My father died in the emergency room at the hands of inexperienced staff. I believe that if we divert to a majority of simulation, we will lose the human touch, the human care, the 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 experiences that you cannot gain out of a textbook, out of a video, out of simulation. I believe simulation is best used for the more advanced practice um, situations where critical thinking is more of the end goal for people who have already experienced what a pulse feels like, what heart rate 
what uh what lung sounds like what does cold and clammy look like what is cool you know all of those things but until we get to that point i really believe that the nursing school the pre-licensure should focus more solely on clinical experience with patients and i'm saying that as someone who's worked with pre-licensure i've been responsible for onboarding of new grads um experienced nurses and even residents. So I've seen the full gamut from novice to expert, and I've seen where simulation has worked and where it has absolutely failed, failed people. And in order for us to set people up for success, in order for us to maintain patient and public safety, it's gonna be critical that we do not allow simulation to exceed um, more to this 50%. I believe that will be extremely harmful for patients. And we will see that in, uh, in patient deaths in medical errors. And I think that's something that we really want to take a look at closely. Thank you. Thank you. Saskia Kim would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead. With the California Nurses Association. CNA supports the use of direct patient care clinical experiences to ensure nurses are ready to provide safe patient care when they graduate. CNA has historically opposed replacing direct patient care clinical experience with skills laboratory learning. The most sophisticated mannequin cannot replicate the human response to nursing care or indicate the subtle changes that can occur during the course of an illness. It cannot replace mentored experiential time with patients in the actual environment of care, and students should be educated so that they're able to develop skills and critical thinking abilities rather than simply being trained in tasks. The observations made and knowledge acquired during clinical training are the beginning of a vast amount of experiential learning that is going to be needed to provide safe and effective direct care to patients in hospitals, clinics, and community settings. CNA believes protection of the public requires direct patient care experience. We worry about the potential for reduced clinical competency when direct patient care experience is decreased. CNA encourages you to wait for the NCSBN study referenced by Ms. Melby that will recommend a minimum number of clinical hours. And I also want to note quickly that the 2014 NCSBN simulation study that's often cited by proponents of increased simulation actually had many students drop out of the study. And those students were disproportionately students from minority groups and returning veterans. Also, the study group that had 50% clinical hours replaced by simulating the highest rate of dropout. And we'd also note that NCLEX scores have gone down during the pandemic in California and 45 other states. In fact, the most recent annual schools report also noted that 97% of schools in California substituted simulation for clinical experiences during the pandemic. Although we don't yet know if there's a causal relationship between those two facts, there's arguably a correlation worth noting. And finally, a 2018 CSBN consensus on nursing education looked at indicators of a quality nursing program and noted that over-reliance on simulation to replace clinical experiences with actual patients was a red flag. This demonstrated broad consensus on the importance of direct patient care. So for all those reasons, CNA respectfully requests that you reject any proposals to reduce the percentage of direct patient care clinical hours. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Hughes would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, Kathy. Hi, this is Kathy Hughes, registered nurse with the Nurse Alliance of SEIU, California. And um, I'm not going to repeat everything that Saskia Kim just said because she can say it so much better than I can. Um, but I do think that it's SEIU nurses think that it's important that we establish a minimum number of patient care hours. Um, I think that the statements that a percentage of what is tremendously profound because we don't know what the of what is. I think we should look at what the minimal number of patient care hours is. So we'd be interested in pursuing that with NEWAC. Thank you very much. Thank you. Katie Waxman would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead. Katie Waxman. And I am the director of the California Simulation Alliance and a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. I wanna point out that the AAC and the American um, Association of Colleges of Nursing just came out with the new essentials for nursing education and they are all competency based. I believe we need to move away from ours and move to a competency based education system. 
the essentials that have been published include simulation. They are supportive of incorporating simulation into our education for our nursing students. I also want to point out that a recent systematic review of the literature by Leighton et al. looked at outcomes with the clinical experience and came up with an empty review of the literature. That means we have not sufficient evidence to show that the clinical experience actually makes a difference. Students often are observing and not doing hands-on patient care. Clinical sites are diminishing. My third point is that in terms of the NEWAC, I feel very strongly that a simulation expert needs to stay on that committee going forward. Simulation has a lot of evidence to support that it works. And we should not have to supply any more evidence. We need to start looking at actually the clinical experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board President Chihilio, there are no other public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Okay, Lori, was there anything else on this that you need to discuss? No, there is not. Um, just if there's any comments or questions after public comment from our board members. If not, um, we will move this conversation forward to NEWAC and we will um, get some evidence together and um, you will hear from us in the future when we establish a direct patient care minimum. Um, I, I, I heard KT Waxman and she said, we don't need to bring any more proof forward for simulation. That's correct. Um, and with simulation that could be done in the schools in any manner that they choose to once we establish a direct patient a minimum standard. Um, and uh, the way that the Department of Education sets up financial aid um, and the way that they have um, the unit requirements for degrees, um, unfortunately, that's still down to ours. Um, so we do have to stay in alignment with that at this point. But um, in the future, um, that would be something that we'd be happy to, to take a look at and have that competency based. Um, I really feel comfortable with our deans and directors. Our deans and directors are all board approved. Our curriculum is all reviewed by our NECs and again, brought to the board for approval. Um, and they do an amazing job with that. And that's, that's why we work as a nursing education consultants and not just evaluators um, within our BRN. And so our, our nursing education consultants are able to work with curricular design. They're able to give input um, to meet objectives, all of our clinicals are uh, sites are approved based on whether or not they can meet the clinical objectives. Um, so I, I think we've got a really good process. We just need to refine that. And I think we start with doing a minimum direct patient care and allowing our nursing programs to have the autonomy that they need to do the simulation that suits their school. Um, and then we move forward from there and we start the stop the back and forth about we need this and we can't support this, but we really look at the, the safety and establish the minimum requirements. So I thank you guys very much for allowing me to bring this topic forward um, and to bring this to NEWAC. And um, I hope that we make some really good movements over the next um, year to really kind of address this. Thank you guys. Thank you, Lori. I just my my um, Webex just went kaputs and I just barely got I mean I, I barely got on so sorry if you I missed did not you. Mubita. no problem you were you were very pivotal in discussions before so thank you for that um, I believe now Reza is this when we would go to um, closed session if we have covered all the uh, outstanding agenda items then uh, yeah, I think it, it's a good time for that. Yes, all agenda items have been covered. We are at agenda item 12.0, closed session. Board members, the um, link has been emailed to you. If you have accepted it in your email box and accept the notification, you will have to access it from your calendar. You will click on your calendar. You will click on that and be able to click on the link. Make sure you are using the closed section for, um, Day two, um, not closed session for day one. So it is a separate one. And then for the public, please understand that we are going into closed session 
All agenda items on the agenda have been covered. We will only be coming back to adjourn and no other board um, business will be taken care of after this. So you are free to exit the WebEx um, and uh, not worry about having to miss anything. So we are going into closed session now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori.